grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is taken from Luke chapter 4, verse 31. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. Here ends the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. The man came to town to look at him. He wasn't anything special. His clothing was not fancy like a rich man's clothes, nor were they rags like a beggar's. He was of average height. His eyes were the typical brown of the day. He was only around 30 years old, give or take. In fact, the only thing that seemed unusual about him was that his friends were clearly hanging on every word he said. Still, the people recognized him. This was the son of the widow Mary. Just a few weeks ago, he had been invited to a wedding at town, and at that wedding, he had turned water into wine. Now, nobody at that time knew what was happening, but the servants did, and believe me, they spilled the beans. So when Jesus returned to town after a disastrous visit to Nazareth, the people were delighted. Jesus was so welcomed in Capernaum that it became kind of his home base for his ministry in Galilee. Jesus went to the worship service on the very first Sabbath he was in town. In fact, that was his regular practice to go to church when it was open. And I'd like to point out that that faithful attendance at worship service is something that Jesus did and we should all emulate. Anyway, Luke doesn't tell us specifically what the message was. We don't have... Jesus' sermon for the day. But we are told that he came to proclaim the good news, that is the gospel, of the kingdom of God. And that is exactly what he did in Nazareth, where he was rejected. He was rejected because he told them that the message of the good news of the kingdom of God is fulfilled in him. Jesus would have told the congregation in Capernaum the same thing. In Nazareth, Jesus read from and quoted from the, from the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. This passage of Isaiah is exactly what Jesus was all about. So his visit to Capernaum was all about this as well. When he was in Nazareth, he said, this passage is fulfilled in me. And That is why this story is part of our Epiphany lessons. The Epiphany season is all about the surprise revelation that this normal-looking guy, the son of the widow Mary, is in reality God in the flesh. He was the one to whom the prophets pointed. He was the solution to mankind's problems, all of them, that had been brought about by sin. This man who had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him was the long-awaited Messiah. He came 
not only to destroy and overthrow the works of Satan, but also to build and to plant the kingdom of God. The establishment of the kingdom of God is done first and foremost by his word. That is why our lesson from the gospel is bookend both sides there by referring to the word. This is why we are told that the demon was cast out by the word of Jesus. That is why we are told that Jesus rebuked the fever of Peter's mother-in-law. That is why we are told that the people were astounded by the word of Jesus. You would have thought, oh, they would have been astounded by the healing or by casting out demons. But Luke says, the word of Jesus. They manifest that he is the anointed one, the Savior. His words reveal his authority, but his authority is one based on service. And the key to that service is the cross of Christ. Now, if we take our cue from our reading out of 1 Corinthians, uh, just the last verse of chapter 14 and all of chapter 13, uh, Paul gives us there the world's best description of love. We see this type of love manifested in Jesus. All day long, the people were coming to Jesus seeking help. Most of us would get sick and tired of that. We would complain about all these crybabies always coming and saying, give me, give me, give me. Help me, Jesus. Heal me, Jesus. Touch me, Jesus. While it was shocking when it came out and still, you know, kind of shocking, uh, we can somehow relate to the words of Jesus in the rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar. There is a song there. The title is The Temple. And in it, all the people are coming to Jesus, you know, wanting his attention wanting to be healed by Jesus. And at the end, Jesus is just so frustrated. He says, there's too many of you. Don't push me. There's too little of me. Don't crowd me. Heal yourselves. And how often might we have felt like that if we had been in Jesus' place? But that isn't how Jesus responds, is it? For love is patient and kind. It is not irritable or resentful. These words of Paul describe Jesus. Where we would lash out and push people away, he keeps welcoming them and bringing to them the kingdom of God. When the apostle John wrote, God is love, he no doubt had Jesus in mind. Jesus is the manifestation of God's love. So Paul once wrote, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This love that Jesus has manifested his divinity through is for no, it is only, it's not a type of love that we have. It is a divine love. And for the sake of his divine love, Jesus is patient and kind towards us. He bears all things, endures all things, and delivers up his body to save us. This same love is why he sent the prophets. He calls and sends them as ministers of his word to pluck up and break down to destroy and overthrow, to build and plant. The word does this because the word of God is living and active. By his word, God created the heavens and the earth. But an even more remarkable miracle, by his word, he has created a new life in you. One born from the water and the word. So Jesus once said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, 
but has passed from death to life. And St. Paul could simply call it the word of life. This word of life is the gospel that spreads the kingdom of God. It is the message that God became a man. It reaches its apex when Jesus suffers and dies for us that we might receive forgiveness and eternal life. This is the message of the cross that is foolishness to the world. We can see that clearly in the reception that Jesus got in his hometown of Nazareth. It was just unbelievable that Jesus was the Messiah. But to those who are being saved, it is the message of God that brings eternal life. It is then the message of God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord. The man came to town. To look at him, there wasn't anything special. His clothing wasn't rich and opulent like somebody from a wealthy home. They weren't rags like those worn of a pauper. He was of average height. His eyes were brown like everybody else's. He was maybe 30, give or take. In fact, the only, the only thing that seemed unusual about him was how his friends were clinging to his every word. But he was unusual. Indeed, there has never been anyone like him, for he is the only begotten son of the Father. His friends hung to, on to his every word, because they knew that those words were the gateway to the kingdom of God. We know that also. Those words open to us the way to God and his love. They open the kingdom of God. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us